And as I said, this principle in itself has 20 principles which are based upon it. But inshallah, we'll re uh, uh, delay that for inshallah for another time. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit for us from what we've learned. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wa salli allahumma ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahibi wa sallam. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I'd like, I've got uh, in front of me, subhanAllah, a lot of questions. And I asked those brothers, if you wrote a question uh, to me, and I didn't get a chance to answer because you only have a few minutes, whenever you see me at any time, feel free to ask me the question, inshallah. I would not like to leave, return back to the United States without asking, uh, answering any question of any brother if I know the answer. If I don't know the answer, inshallah, I'll refer you to one of the sheikhs, like Sheikh Ali or Sheikh Mohammed Ismail. I'll be glad to translate their response on your behalf. Uh, here's one question it says, uh, over here, taking just from the top of the list, it says, you mentioned uh, Abdul Wahab as being a sheikh. Uh, what is his status among the people of knowledge? And some say that he was a spy from the West, and disobeyed the caliph by giving uh, the pledge to Ibn Saud. Okay, the question puts three points right over here. First of all, his name wasn't Abdul Wahab. That's his dad's name, okay? His name was Muhammad, the son of Abdul Wahab. And as far as him being a sheikh, he had many scholars in Medina and also in Iraq. And if you look at the book written by his students, he had many chains of transmission, you know, because the scholars, the true scholars before, they used to, you could prove their scholarship because they would say, that they studied upon a certain scholar, which studied upon a certain scholar, which studied upon a certain scholar. Like Sheikh Ali in, in this, uh, Sheikh Ali al-Halabi, he has a chain of narration going back to Imam al-Bukhari, which he has taken from his Sheikh uh, Badi al-Din al-Shah, Sindhi. This is how the scholars are now. They used to have chains connecting them back to previous scholars. Sheikh Ibn Abdul Wahab has more than one chain of narration going back to Ibn Taymiyyah to Ibn al-Qayyim, and then, I'm jumping centuries here, going to Imam Ahmed, going to Sufyan, going to Ibn Abbas, going to the Prophet Muhammad in a lot of points of knowledge. So as far as his knowledge, it's, it's well confirmed. The uh, second thing is that he was a spy for the West. Well, unfortunately, when he uh, died, which was like the year 1705, there wasn't the West as we understand it. The West didn't have any influence in the Arabian Peninsula. A lot of people feel or misunderstand that he lived in this century, like in 1920 and so forth, and that's a complete error in history. He died in 1705, even before the founding of the United States. The United States is 1776, right? So he was like 71 years before the United States and the West and so forth even existed. And the third thing that he disobeyed the caliph by giving pledge to Ibn Saud. This is also another lie, because you will find letters in which he wrote the Khalifa of the Muslims at a time in Turkey, in Istanbul, saying, we are your humble servants, and we are so forth, and we are in your loyalty, and so forth. And this is all documented historically. And there are two books which talk about his life in English, and might mention this, one which comes out of Al-Jama'a Salafi in India, in Barnabas, uh, written by a Sheikh al nadwi or something like that. I don't know, you might have it here, or maybe some of the brothers have it. And another book which came out of uh, Ihsan Allah al rahimahullah alayhi's uh, daughter translated, written by Ibn Hajar al-Bukhani uh, from Qatar, and was printed in Pakistan. So maybe some of the brothers uh, have this book here in England, and they can... Uh, if the person has, uh, would like to know more about this subject, they can ask Brother Manoa, or maybe Brother Manoa can get them a copy or a photocopy of that book. Uh, the question is, what is Ahl al-Hadith? Are they different from the four schools of thought? As I mentioned, that Ahl al-Hadith in the beginning is synonymous for Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah. It's the same meaning. Are they different than the four schools of thought? Depends on what you mean over here. If you mean that the Imams of the four schools of thought, namely Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmed, had a belief different than the belief of Ahl al-Hadith, this is impossible to uh, be. And I'd like to explain to you an example. When Ibn Taymiyyah wrote his uh, creed, which he was termed al-Wasatiyya, al he was called by the scholars of his day for a debate concerning the authenticity of this belief. And the Sultan of his time, uh, in Damascus, the uh, Khalifa's representative in Damascus, he said, to, just to try to break the argument, he said, okay, what really happened, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, is that you wrote a belief according to the creed of Imam Ahmed. According to the creed of Imam Ahmed. And therefore, since Imam Ahmed is one of the four methods, 
there is no problem. Ibn Taymi did not accept it. He said, no, this is not what I penned in the Aqid al the belief of Imam Ahmed. Nor it is my belief, for it is not for me or for Ahmed to come with our own belief. This is the belief of the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and all the Imams. And then he challenged his, those people who were debating with him and arguing with him from the Ash'ari. He said, I give you three years. Three years. And now it's been seven centuries. What did he challenge them? He said that you bring a single proof that any scholar, whether that scholar attributed himself to Ahl al-Hadith, to the Hanafis, the Malikis, the Shafis, to the Hanbalis, came with a belief which is outside of the belief which I penned in Aqid al Wasufiyah. And now it's been seven centuries and these people have not been able to produce a single evidence. And they won't be able to the day of judgment because the beliefs of the Imam are the beliefs of Ahl al-Hadith. It is one and the same. Now, if you mean by the four schools, or the questioner means by the four schools, what the people who attribute themselves today as followers of the four schools believe into, the beliefs might be different. And that is because not everybody who attributes himself to something is actually a follower of that thing. I'll give you an example. The Christians, who do they say they follow? Do they say they follow the Messiah, Isa and Maryam? Are they upon the belief of Isa and Maryam? No. And likewise, you find people who attribute themselves to the, the Prophet, they say that he's from his ummah, like Ibn Sina, who said the Prophet ﷺ came up and made up these things for the people. Is this the belief of the Prophet ﷺ? And that is why Ibn Taymiyyah, in one of his books, he said, I came across a sheikh from Al-Bukhara, who knew Ibn, whose father knew Ibn Sina, Ibn Sina. So I asked him, what did your father used to think of Ibn Sina? And he said he was a smart Catholic. So the point is not that everybody who attributes himself to something is actually a follower of that. So the beliefs of the people today, of course, differ from the beliefs of the four imams themselves, and the beliefs of the four imams itself are the beliefs of Ahl al-Hadith, and they are the beliefs of Ahl al-Sunnah in general. And this is, of course, in itself is a topic by itself. Um, okay, this says over here a question in Arabic, says, and I'll just translate it in English. It says that there is uh, here, هناك دعوة يدعيها الكثير ممن يحسبون على الصحوة الإسلامية بل هم قادة لهذه الصحوة وعلى رأسهم لمن سمعت من من شخصيا راشد الغنوشي رئيس حزب النهضة تونس أن غالبية المسلمين أشاعرة فما هو ردكم على هذا وما هي أحوال العقيدة الشعرية؟ Okay, so this question has a number of parts. I'll just translate quickly in English. He said there are some people who are leaders of different Islamic movements, and the brother over here mentioned uh, uh, one person in particular, راشد الغنوشي uh, from uh, Tunis. And that this person says that most of the Muslims are Ash'aris, so how do you refute this and what is the, actually the, the uh, situation of the Ash'ari Aqeedah? Well, as far as the last part, what is the situation of the Ash'ari Aqeedah? It is an Aqeedah which goes against Ahl al Jama'ah. That's just a quick answer. And since a person wrote uh, me a question in Arabic, I refer him to the book uh, by Sheikh Safar al Hawari in refuting the Ash'ari Aqeedah. He summarized in a small booklet, and it's probably one of the best things a person who uh, doesn't have the ability or the time to go deeply into the book to read to understand the Ash'ari Aqeedah. And I have a copy in my room so that we can get a, the question, person who asked the question a photocopy before I leave, we can get him a copy, a uh, photostat of it. As far as uh, Rashad al ghanoushi saying this, I don't know that he actually said this. I've only met him one time in Washington, D.C. And so I, therefore I prefer not to say that this is his statement since I've never heard it, heard it or read it. But this statement is said by many people historically that most of the Muslims are Ash'ari, right? And the question is, in general, so what if this was true? If this was true, then most of them were Ash'ari. Because most of the people in the world today are non-Muslims. Is this an evidence that Islam is incorrect? That the majority? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet that if you obey most of the people on the earth, they will set you astray. They'll set you off the path. So the question, the analogy of using numbers is not a correct analogy in the first place. Second of all, what is the proof? How in the world can you say that the majority of the Muslims throughout history were Ash'aris. If you look at the Prophet's companions, and the Tabi'een, and the third generation, and even today the majority of the Muslims who are non-scholars, just the general folk of the Muslims, they are all upon the Aqid of Ahl and Jama'ah. So this is a false, a false claim which has just been passed on by in history, used by the Ash'aris to pump up a, a, uh, a faith which has no foundation, to prop up a hollow belief of theirs. And, this, and, it's, and the reason why the spread of the Ash'ari Mazhab, it has some historical reasons, which perhaps I'll get into in my other lecture uh, tomorrow 
I discussed the issue of the uh, uh, sex. Wallahu a'lam. Um, uh, okay, there's a question here uh, about what Sheikh Bilal, uh, my teacher, wrote in his book, Tafsir Surah al Hujarat. And I think that since uh, we have Sheikh Bilal over here, the question is best to refer to Sheikh Bilal himself, right? And for me to answer on his behalf. Okay, dear brother, Jazakallah khairan, uh, wa iyakum. Uh, you have said that there is a group that mixed politics and religion. Please, can you explain what uh, you've exactly meant and what is your point of view? Well, I didn't say a group of men politics uh, with religion. I don't think I said such a thing. I said that, unfortunately, there is a group of people who misunderstand the word sunnah to exclusively mean, and I gave just two examples, one to mean politics and one to mean just the 